All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, tonight we're gonna to be doing the Doppler effect. I know that some of you have been attending these lessons quite um, diligently over the last little while. And one of the things that is rather impressive about where we are is tonight will be the start of the ninth week that we've been running the extra lessons. With it being the ninth week, there's also something else that's coming in, and that's that we're halfway through the beginning and the end. So what I am planning on doing, although I may not necessarily do it at the end of this week, but at another point, is we will be having a mid, kind of mid-session break. I was initially thinking of doing it across exactly in the middle, but I actually think it makes more sense to put it when the school holidays are. Can I ask, is everybody in agreement here that across that week when you're given your school holidays off, that we call that a school holiday as well? So we officially know from now that you're going to have a school holiday across the school holiday. I did plan for us to have a break in the middle, just also for my family's um, sanity. So we will have a break across the week of, um, I think it's going to be the, the week of the, the Women's Day that week. So I think it's the 9th, just after the 9th of um, August, there will be a lesson off, just that everybody's aware of that. Okay. What we're going to be doing today is the Doppler effect. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Now, I did check before we went into this that many of you had already done the Doppler effect, and I'm not planning on sharing that one. Ha, huh? I'm going to do this firsthand, so let's get going. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, I just need to check <laughs> that I'm sharing the right thing now. <laughs> yes, I'm sharing my whiteboard. Good. All right, I've tried as far as I can to avoid sharing the notes that I use in class. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but I know my own students, if I'm using the same set of notes for both, I'm not going to pay in one. No, they're not going to pay attention in one of the two. So I'd rather do it offhand here and make sure that we've got the same stuff. All right. So we're going to be looking at the Doppler effect. Now, the Doppler effect is a really nice standalone section. And what it has to do with is the Doppler effect is the apparent change in frequency of a wave due to the relative motion of a source, oh, this isn't really behaving very well today, of a source and an observer. So the idea is, that there is an apparent change in the frequency of a wave. Now, that wave could be a sound wave, or it could be a light wave, so it could be an electromagnetic wave, it could be any kind of wave. And it has to do with the apparent change in frequency. Remember, frequency is the number of waves per second. And it has to do with relative motion. Now, relative motion means that the source, that's what creates the sound or creates the wave, and the observer which detects the wave. We have to have a relative motion of the source and the observer. That means that the source and the observer must either be moving towards each other or away from each other. If they're both moving at exactly the same speed in either direction, their relative motion doesn't change. So the relative motion is either that they move towards each other or away from each other. Now, one of the first things that you need to know is with the Doppler effect, it is only ever an apparent change. It is never a real change, okay? Now, the easiest way to explain that this is an apparent change and not a real change, I always use the example of my own children. So, my son, when he was a little, little boy, very little, about two, all he wanted in the entire world was an older sister because his little friend, 
had an older sister and he really wanted an older sister. Now, I'm sure many of you can appreciate that me giving my son an older sister was not possible. Once people have had children, they can't change the order in which their children are born, nor can they change how far apart they are in terms of age. So if I have children, nothing I can do is going to make the age gap between my children bigger or smaller once they have been born. All right? I'm quite certain he's making noise, but unless you've got a question, please mute. If you have a question, by all means, ask. So the frequency, the true frequency, never changes. True frequency isn't one of those things that we can change. Once we've made a wave, those waves, we've made a fixed number per second. And once we've made them, we can't unmake them and we can't change how we made them when we've already made them. But what can change is what other people um, detect them to be. All right. So I want to quickly give you my best analogy as to how I view the Doppler effect. And we're going to look at the fact that frequency is fixed, but if there's relative motion, you can get an apparent change in frequency. So I'm from Cape Town. I know many of you are from Cape Town. And if I go to the beach, not during lockdown, before lockdown, if I went to the beach and I stood in the water, I would have a fixed number of waves hit me per second. This may surprise you, but waves are about eight seconds apart. I know, I've gone and timed them. So if I stand in the water, I will have one wave hit me every eight seconds if I'm standing still. That means that the frequency of the waves is one eighth. So I get 0 0.125 wave, um, waves hitting me each second. Now imagine that instead of standing still, I ran into the water. I would have more waves hitting me per unit time if I'm running into the water. It isn't that the waves are coming more frequently. The true frequency of the waves hasn't changed. It's that relative to the waves, I'm now moving into them and therefore I'm hitting them more often. So if we have two objects and they move towards each other, the frequency inevitably increases, it goes up. If instead of running into the waves, I turned around and I ran out, I could run at such a pace, if I'm very smart, that a wave never hit me. Now we're not gonna be dealing with waves that are that far apart, but we could deal with the idea that if you turn and you run out of the water, you probably will have fewer waves per unit time hitting you. Does this analogy make sense to everybody? The idea of running into the sea, more waves hitting you, and if you run out, fewer waves hitting you, but the fact that the entire time, the actual frequency of the waves doesn't really change. So that's one, I find, real practical example where you've got a source and an observer that are moving. Now, in the case of the water waves in the sea, we have a situation where the source, which is the sea producing the waves, is stationary. I am the observer. I am the person getting hit by the waves, going, oh my gosh, I got hit by a wave. Oh my gosh, I got hit again. So I'm detecting the waves. And therefore, in that case, I am the one that's moving. So the detector is moving closer to the source. This can be the case when you've got a police car with its siren going and it's parked and somebody moves towards it or drives towards it or drives away from it. That is the case of where um, the, the source is stationary and the observer is moving. We can also have it the other way around where we have a stationary observer. I'm standing on the side of a road and a police car drives past me. Now, I'm going to do my best because I don't actually have the ability to let you hear the vocals that I normally would put on in a, um, in a, in a classroom. There's that lovely thing about as the car goes past, it goes, meow. Is there, has anyone here ever heard the meow noise that I'm talking about? Where you have a really loud sound and it comes towards you, goes past you, and then changes frequency. That is the Doppler effect. That is an apparent change in frequency. And what will happen? is that as it is approaching you, the frequency will be higher than its true frequency. And as it passes you and moves away from you, the frequency will be lower than the true frequency. Please note when it comes to sound, and I'm gonna go back to sharing so that I can write this all down, I'm gonna quickly make a little note here that says, if they are approaching, 
or moving towards each other. Then we will find that the frequency increases. Please note that means that in the case of sound, the sound pitch gets higher. In the case of sound, your frequency is linked to pitch. So if you have something that's squeaky, squeaky is high pitched. If you have something that's got a deep sound, that is a low pitch. Okay, an example of this that I find is a rather interesting one to, to touch on is the idea of a mosquito. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that you can actually tell from how the mosquito sounds, whether it's getting closer to you or further away. If you're listening to the mosquito and it's in your room and it gets higher and higher and higher pitched, that is the frequency going up and it is moving towards you and it's gonna eat you. If on the other hand, you hear the frequency of a mosquito and it sounds like it's getting lower, deeper pitched, that means that the mosquito is moving away from you. All right, so we can actually use Doppler effect in a large number of real life situations. Ideally, I know many of us would rather that we didn't have mosquitoes full stop. If we're looking, instead of them approaching, that they're instead moving apart or away from each other, then the frequency decreases. And in the case of a sound, the pitch gets lower. All right. We can also link this to other things. We can link this Doppler effect idea, not only to sound, but also to light. Many of you haven't yet done the photoelectric effect, so you haven't yet really gone and revised the different range of the electromagnetic spectrum. But a higher frequency in light tends to be on the blue side of the spectrum. So blue or violet, that's higher frequency. And on light, the lower frequencies tend to be towards the red side of our, side of our visible spectrum. You remember over here we have um, ultraviolet is the high frequency. And then obviously below ultraviolet, we have violet and blue and then our full rainbow color ending on red. And after red, we're going to have infrared. And that over there is the low frequency. So we have our full range over there. All right. Um, can I just quickly ask before I go too much further, does this make sense to everybody? Everything that I've discussed so far, is it fitting in with your understanding? Especially those of you that have never done this before, is it making sense? Please, if it isn't making sense, Send me a message. All right. Okay. I need to know the questions as we as we reach them if there are any questions. All right. So what I would like to do now is I would like to just quickly share a document with you that shows two diagrams that are quite often used to describe these before we move on to doing the actual calculations. So over here, this is the more complicated uh, a diagram. Over here, what we have is we have a moving observer. Uh, sorry, not a moving observer, a moving source. Talking rubbish. A moving source. Sometimes in, in we, source is usually going to be S. Okay. And then L here. We either use L or O. L is for listener, O is for observer. It doesn't really make too much of a difference. Okay. All right, just give me a second. Somebody asked if I can go back. I'm not promising that it's still there. I'm going to do my best and hope that it is. All right. So I apologize. Sometimes when I do these things, I can't actually go back. I'm just going to quickly try my whiteboard. Yay, okay, I do have everything still on my whiteboard. All right, please take a screenshot of this quickly if you need anything that's on here. Okay, one, two, three, time's up. Okay, so I'm now going to go back to where we were and I'm gonna share on, no, 
No, no, where's it gone? That one. All right. So, sorry, see it's removed my writing. It does that every time I leave anything that is in my whiteboard. So over here, as I mentioned, we have got a moving source of sound. This diagram can be asked, so that's why we touch on it to make sure that you understand it. So what I'd like you to imagine here is that the source is making a sound and then as it makes that sound, once the sound's made, the sound spreads out and travels at a constant speed, okay? So what happened is S1 is where the source made a sound four seconds ago. When that source was made, it would just be a tiny dot. One second later, it would be a circle this big. Two seconds later, a circle this big. Three seconds later, a circle this big. And four seconds later, the outside circle. Please also note that the center of the circle would be where it was made. So four seconds after the source made the sound here, that corresponds to how far over here the sound has traveled, okay, or the wave has traveled. It is the outside or the outermost of the circles. But this is a moving source. So it made that sound four seconds ago. Then it moved one second and made another sound. That sound moved that far in the first second, that far in the second second, and this far in the third second. So this is where the, the sound now is. That, is, that was made at S2. Please, you will notice that its center is S2. Then the source moved, and it moved one second across, so one second later it was over here. In the first second, the size of the circle was this big, but remember the circle would actually have been around here. Just to give you an idea, it would have been around here. I'm gonna undo that so you can see it. I'm just showing you the size, so it would have been here, and then it went this big, so over there, that was created by the source when it was at S3. Um, and then when it moves to S4, it made a, a, it made a sound or sent out a, a wave and the wave has traveled to here. Okay, so this idea is that you must understand that the waves, once the wave's been produced, it, it travels outwards. And obviously the first sound that was made or the first wave that was made has had the longest to travel. Each wave was made at a different position, so it'll have a different center. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the number of waves that are gonna hit per second. Do you notice that because this source is moving in this direction, it is effectively moving towards listener two. Do you notice over here, because it's moving towards the right, it is moving away from listener one. If you look at the waves, can you see that there are more waves bunched up together heading towards listener two? So listener two is gonna get a higher frequency, more waves per unit time will detect a higher frequency. Here, the waves are spreading out. And in fact, you can see as they're spreading out. So over here, we will have fewer waves, which means that there will be a lower frequency. So a higher frequency when there is an approach and a lower frequency when they move apart, okay? Can I quickly ask, does this make sense to everybody? Are there any questions that you have on that particular diagram? If you need me to explain it further, please by all means ask. All right, good. So I'm gonna take the, the lack of comments as everybody being good with it. I can't see any questions. Now, one place where you may have seen something like this is on a sailboat. If any of you have ever been on a sailboat and you look behind you and you see your wake, your wake looks pretty much like this. What often ends up happening is a wake looks like this after a boat, and it's because the boat which is producing the waves is traveling, in fact, faster than the waves. It moves through the waves that it's producing. When we talk about um, airplanes overcoming the sound barrier, literally, 
That is an airplane moving faster than the sound waves it is producing. So it will effectively end up doing this really cool thing where it's producing waves and it looks like that. That's something that has gone faster than the waves that it is producing, okay? I've got two diagrams here. And then once I've done both of them, I'm actually gonna show you a simulation which makes this happen real time, which is a little bit easier, I think, to understand. But if we haven't discussed it first, then there's too much to discuss at one point. All right, let me scroll this down just a little bit. Here is the second diagram. In this case, you have got a stationary source. So the source that's producing waves is in one place. Because of this, the waves all move out from it. So they're all concentric. They all have one single center. So these are concentric waves. Okay, the other ones weren't concentric. Their circle center was definitely different. So here we have a listener or an observer. I prefer observer personally. We have an observer moving towards the source. And this is like my example of running into the sea. As the observer moves towards the source, it will have more waves per second hitting it. So there will be a higher frequency. On the other hand here, this listener is moving out. So it is an observer moving away from the source. So therefore it will have a, a, a lower detected frequency. Please, once again, I know I keep saying lower frequency and higher frequency. All of these refer to the observed frequency. The true frequency of the waves, as I mentioned at the beginning, does not change. All right, so to give you an idea as to how this works, I've got one of my favorite simulations here. Can I double check? Can all of you see a weird spacecraft, like a, a space thing, like a rocket? Can everybody see my rocket? Okay, cool. Yay, you're able to see the rocket. I can't make this one bigger. I've tried repeatedly. But what I can do is you can see the number of waves per second. So I'm going to move my observer. Oh, he doesn't start further away. I'm going to have my observer and I set him moving towards the way, towards the source. Can you see here that the number of waves passing per second is increasing? It went up. There were more waves. Now as he moves away, can you see the number of waves, the actual lines hitting him, has gone down? So our frequency changed. Once he is stationary relative to the source, his frequency goes back to the true frequency. All right. Now I'm going to do a new setup where the source will approach the observer. You can see what I was talking about earlier with the waves being created and how they bunch up in front and become less behind. Here you can see how the frequency changes. It was a high frequency there, now it's a low frequency. If we do both of them approaching, then this is even more pronounced. Way more waves per second. Look at that high frequency there. And here, we can probably end up with a situation every now and again where we hardly even have um, a high frequency. There we go, too far for accurate measurements. All right, a transverse motion, it's a little bit tricky. That's where it's going across. and It's not actually moving directly towards or directly away from. And usually with the transverse motion, there is a small amount of effect, a little bit. You'll see there we had a slightly um, lower frequency than normal, but it isn't quite as pronounced. We're not going to test you on those. Also, good news, we only test you on either the observer moving or the source moving. Okay, in matric exams, we do not do both at the same time. It just really makes things horribly horrible. So we don't do both of those together. All right, so I'm gonna quickly stop sharing that. Can I ask quickly, did anybody's teachers in class use the same simulation? It's one that I discovered years ago and I find that it really works well. Can I ask who found it was an interesting thing to actually see the waves frequency being produced and see how they moved away. Hopefully you all found as well that me having explained what was happening before we showed you the simulation as to how it worked, 
made it easier to follow exactly what aspects were happening at any one time. All right. So I'm hoping that you've all at this point got that idea rather comfortably in your head. So the Doppler effect, I'm going to repeat, is the apparent change in frequency due to the relative motion of a source and an observer. Very important. That definition is almost guaranteed to be asked because there's so little that they can ask you on it otherwise. They either don't ask you a definition or that is the definition. Then we come to what is the formula and how can we use the formula. So I'm going to jump into the formula now. I'm going to show you how to manipulate the formula depending on what's moving and whether it's moving towards or away. And then we're going to practice using it. Okay, we may come in and look at some of the specific aspects of the Doppler effect. So we may start looking at the fact that you can use Doppler effect to tell, um, to detect fetal heartbeats, baby's heartbeats. You can also, not quite as glamorous or cute, use Doppler effect if you're worried about people having a deep vein thrombosis, which is a blood clot. Okay, I know I had to, when I was pregnant with my, my second child, I actually had to go have a, a, a Doppler, the same thing you do for cute babies done on my leg. It didn't look very cute at all. And all that it was doing was trying to see if there was a blood clot somewhere in there that was causing my ankle to swell, which is really weird. All right. So without further ado, we're going to go back to the notes that I had and we're going to carry on. All right. So over here, we've gone through the first two. Now this over here is your equation. And I actually am going to make the question that we're doing skip on a little bit and I'll come to it in a second. Okay, so let's just quickly go back up to the, the formula. Okay, nope, up to the formula. It's not listening very well. Okay. I want that, but I want it at the top of my screen there. It was there, and then I ruined it. Okay, cool. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what you're going to get in your um, matric exam, this formula. There was one other formula that was given alongside it that we sometimes use, and that is the equation V is equal to F lambda. Is there a question? Ladies and gentlemen, was there a question there? Kim? Kim's iPhone? Okay, I'm just quickly going to mute. If there is a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and come back. Okay, ah, not that one. There we go. All right, so the other equation that we may need to get into is the equation V is equal to F lambda. And that's on the off chance that instead of giving you um, the, the frequency, they instead give you the wavelength and then you've got to convert from wavelength into frequency in order to solve for something. Okay, so I personally do not use that equation at all. I don't know if any of your schools do. I'm probably going to be in trouble for crossing it out. I tend to use this equation. Now, my recommendation is in an exam, always start by writing down the version that's on the formula sheet. So the frequency of the observer, L stands um, for listener or observer, is V plus or minus VL over V plus or minus VS times by FS. Now, some of the people watching tonight have never done this before, so I'm going to go through it slowly. FL is the frequency of the observer. And it is measured in Hertz. So this is the frequency that the person listening to the sound or detecting the color of light or even measuring with a frequency specific measurer, that is the observed frequency, what we actually observe. Fs, F being frequency, FL frequency, listener, frequency observer, Fs is the frequency of the source. The true frequency, also measured in hertz. Both the values here of V and V, which are the same thing, are the speed of the wave in the medium. I would love to tell you that they always give you everything, but I've seen nasty simultaneous equations where you're given tiny bits of information and then you need to calculate other things. So usually the speed of the wave in the medium is given. Um, just to give you a general idea, the approximate um, speed of sound 
all sounds in air should be around about 300 to 350 meters per second. It's not a fixed value. It depends on the temperature. It depends on whether you're at a high altitude or a low altitude. It depends on the humidity. It depends on all sorts of things. So speed of sound is never a fixed thing. I like to use 330, but it doesn't mean that they can't use 312. Okay. When I said 330, I meant 330, not 313. The speed of sound should be somewhere around about there. The speed of light, you actually know, but remember they may do light through air and then it may change a little bit, is three times 10 to the eight. So the speed of the wave in the medium, they'll usually tell you. If we did speed of sound, this one's for air. If we did it in water, which is also possible, it's approximately 1,500 meters per second. Once again, very approximately, depends on depth, depends on salin, um, salinity, how much salt there is, depends on anything. Then we hit our last two L and S. VL is the velocity of the observer, the listener, and that'll be measured in meters per second, just as our speed of the wave in the medium was in meters per second. If anything's done in kilometers per hour, you've got to convert and Vs is the velocity of the source. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, usually what will happen is that either the observer will remain stationary, so this bit will disappear and you just don't write it down, or the source will remain stationary and this bit will disappear. But my recommendation to make sure that you don't lose your formula mark is you write this down before we decide whether it's gonna be a plus or a minus. And I'm about to explain to you how to decide if it's gonna be a plus or a minus. Some of you are gonna learn this off by heart, and some of you will do what I do, which is every single time I look at it, I have to try and decide what the formula is going to change to. All right, um, just a quick question someone's put here. Ma'am, is the detecting of wavelength of a moving source by a stationary or a moving object um, the same Doppler shift method in astronomy, or is that something different? Samir, this is the example that we often use, is um, if we are talking about in astronomy, blue shift and red shift, that's using the Doppler effect. That's how we know that the universe is expanding. But I'm gonna to get to that just now, same topic, okay? Um, Matt, could they give us the period of wave and ask us to calculate the frequency? Technically, um, that equation, which you just mentioned, um, F is equal to one over T, is given on your formula sheet alongside these three equations. So it is possible. However, it is highly unlikely. Okay, really, really highly unlikely. I have never, ever seen it done. But that's not to say it can't happen. It also isn't a case that they can't actually give, they can give you the graph, beautifully drawn, an oscillation, and you can have to work out what the frequency is from a graph working out the number of waves per second. They can do anything to get you this information. You've got to be prepared to work from it. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to quickly clear this off because I want to discuss with you how we know to do the plus or the minus in this equation. And then we're going to go straight into applying it. That's pretty much it on Doppler effect. We've got to discuss Doppler for heartbeat. We've got to discuss it a little bit for what I was just mentioning to one of the students who asked about the expansion of the universe. But other than that, that's Doppler effect in a, well, in a net nutshell. Lots of practicing though, lots of simultaneous equations, but the theory is pretty quick. All right, so I'm gonna quickly clear all of my drawings and then we're gonna start. So I'm now gonna say, what do we do if we have a moving source? So I'm not just gonna make the moving source, which means that the observer is gonna be stationary. I'm going to show you how I'll rearrange this equation so that it makes sense. So it's not moving. Okay. Now we're going to look at both options. We're going to look at a moving source where it is moving towards the observer, which is state who is stationary. And we're going to look at a moving source, which is moving away from the observer. Now, the first thing I can do is if the observer is stationary, then the velocity of the listener is zero and this entire bit disappears. 
This is the one case where you may make it disappear and not sub in a zero. So we know that if L is equal to V all on its own, plus zero, you don't have to put in. On the bottom, we're going to have V plus or minus V um, S times by Fs. Please note, I quite often when I write it out, do it like that so that I remember I'm multiplying. If L is equal to V over V plus or minus Vs times by Fs. Now I do a weird thing in my head when I see this. If I see it's moving towards the observer, I know that the apparent frequency that I want it to increase. If I want this value to increase, I want the denominator to be as small as possible. If I have the same value divided by a smaller number, I will get a higher frequency. So to make the denominator here as small as possible, I want to have V minus Vs. Number divided by a smaller number gives you a bigger frequency. So the apparent frequency will be larger because they're moving towards each other. Now, please, if my logic as to how I worked it out in my head doesn't make sense to you, by all means, learn it off by heart. But I've never done that. I work from this question each time and sit there and go, wait, we want the frequency to go up or go down, and then I work. Over here, if it's moving away from the observer, we want the apparent frequency to decrease. If we wanted to decrease, we want the same number divided by a bigger number, so that must become a plus. And that is how I decide whether it's a plus or a minus. I look at whether they're moving towards each other or away from each other and figure out which way around, around I want my symbols to work so that it either makes the apparent frequency higher or lower. All right, can I double check just quickly? Please give me a thumbs up. Does this make sense? Thumbs up if it makes sense. Please, if it doesn't, by all means, memorize, okay? Some people like things where they can figure it out each time. Some people like things where they memorize ahead of time and it's really easy. All right, I'm gonna quickly clear this. So please, if you want a snapshot of this, take it now. I'll, you'll see I work it out from scratch each time, okay? So we're gonna clear all drawings. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say last time what we had was a moving, um, a moving source and a stationary observer. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, what about if instead we have a moving observer and therefore we have a stationary source? So there are two options yet again. The observer can move towards the source which is stationary, or it can move away from the source. The equation in both cases is going to be relatively similar. So if L is equal to, now let's start quickly. If we've got a stationary source, the velocity of the source is zero, so it disappears. So here we're going to have V plus or minus VL over V times by Fs. And here we're going to have exactly the same equation. When I write this out in a test, um, I actually leave it blank like I've got here. Sometimes I cheat and I start with a minus because it's easy to turn a minus into a plus. And you can do that. So you just write in a minus and then change it to a plus if you need to. But sometimes it's safer to just work it out from scratch. So if they move towards each other, we know that we want the frequency to increase. If we want the frequency here to be higher, the numerator must be higher. And the easiest way to make the numerator higher is to make this a plus. Okay, so that's the velocity we get there. Here we know that the frequency must decrease when they move away from each other. If this must be lower, my numerator must go um, down. So that makes that a minus. And I find that this makes sense every single time to be able to work out which way around I do my equations. Okay. So I'm just quickly gonna stop sharing. Can I double check, especially for the people who've never done this before, do you understand that there's one equation, but the equation that's given to you is very generic? 
So you need to write it out exactly as you see it on the formula sheet so that you can get the tick mark for it. And then afterwards, you're going to rewrite it and you're going to leave one of the VS or the VL out because one of them will be stationary. And then you're going to manipulate it and work around it. Can I just double check that everybody does understand this nicely, that it does fit in with what you understand and how you see it? Okay, fantastic. That's brilliant. All right. What we're going to move on to now is we're going to try and do an exam question with this. I find that the best way to practice how you do things is to actually just do them. But before I do them, I'm trying to get my two pieces to go back together. The little piece that I moved apart earlier and I took away from where it was. Now it's all grumpy and it won't go back to where it was. Ah, there we go. Okay. I finally convinced them. Give me a second and I'm going to share with everybody. Okay, I'm hoping I haven't picked a really tricky question, but if I have, you know what, we'll live with it. It'll be as tricky as it can get in the exam and that's fine. Okay, please, if you've got any questions you need to ask as we arrive at them. Okay, so this is an exam question. This question is exactly what you'd get in an exam. And you're gonna see that this section's rather nice because we've gone from, oh my gosh, we don't even know what we're doing to, plugging into an exam question in one quick go. I'm gonna to have to explain the red shifts at the end, but we'll get there. So the question says, the Doppler effect is applicable to both sound and light waves. It is also very important applications in our everyday life. So you are told here that a hooter on a stationary train emits a sound. Please note that hooter on the stationary train is your source. The fact that it is a stationary train says that ideally um, this should be that the velocity of the source is zero, but don't jump to conclusions just yet. It emits a sound with a frequency. So the frequency of the source is 520 hertz. I find that when I read through this, I immediately try to identify all of the variables that we've got up here, and I actually write it so that I can see it. As detected by a person standing on the platform. Standing implies stationary. Please remember that if somebody's standing, they're not likely to be standing and moving. Standing is a standing stationary. You can assume that the speed of sound is 340 meters per second in still air. That is your value of V, your speed of um, the wave through the medium. So that is 340 meters per second. The first thing that you're asked to do is to calculate the wavelength of the sound detected by the person. Now we haven't got a Doppler effect here. We haven't got any apparent change in frequency or any apparent change in wavelength. This is just them saying to you, what is this, the wavelength of the sound that we're gonna get? So here we're gonna use that equation, V is equal to F lambda. Please note, a lot of the time when you've been applying this, especially if you've done photoelectric effect, you're gonna be trying to sub in silly values for V. V here is the speed of the wave through the medium. So it is 340 is equal to our frequency, which is 520. That was written very badly. So I'm just going to quickly rewrite it. 520 multiplied by the wavelength. So the wavelength is going to be 340 divided by 520, which gives me 0, 0,65 meters. All right. Okay, so I've got a question that's to be, just been asked, and I'm going to quickly um, break because I've finished the end of this, but we'll move on. And they said, ma'am, how would the situation work if the wave from a source like a police car is reflected on the observer like a warehouse? Now, I haven't usually seen these, but there are some cases where it's a bit weird, and you, you, I've seen ones where bats emit a sound, the sound bounces off a surface and then comes back and is detected by the bat. And we end up with the weird situation where the echo of the building is the source. So the building is the source and the bat is the observer to the frequency that it created. So when we've got weird things like um, a wave being produced by a police car reflected um, on the warehouse, 
So if you have a weird situation like that, what you've got to ask in your head is if this was reflected or something, that something becomes the new source. The source is where the wave was created from. And if it echoes, it comes from where it hit and bounced back, not from the original, original source. Okay, so it's a very weird thing, but yes, Samir, echolocation, that's what we're talking about here too. Okay, so there, there's a whole bunch here that, that can be done. Echolocation is more about how far away things are, but in the case of certain things, they can also use it to tell how fast things are moving. So quite often, um, if you watch on movies and things where they're talking about submarines and they say, there's something and it's headed this way, it's because they can tell that it's getting closer, et cetera. But it isn't a typical use and it isn't definitely an examinable use. Okay, but you can tell the relative movement. That's how they use Doppler in blood to detect the blood flow rate, is they measure how fast um, they, they send in a sound wave, ultrasound, and it bounces back of moving um, blood cells and how fast the blood cells are moving is detected using Doppler. So you've got an apparent change in frequency as things bounce back. All right, so the next question here gets a bit tricky. This one gets tricky because we're dealing with wavelength. So it says calculate the wavelength of the sound detected. This wavelength, now I know we've said frequency that the listener observes, this is going to become wavelength that the listener observes. So calculate the wavelength of the sound detected by the person when the train moves towards him so this train is no longer stationary. Why stationary? But we've now got the train moving towards him at a constant speed of 15 meters per second. So we can now say that the velocity of the source is 15 meters per second. We can also know that since it moves towards him, we should have our frequency going up and the hooter is still emitting the sound. Now what I'm gonna suggest you do is if you ever get asked a question where you're asked to calculate wavelength or you're given wavelength, change everything to frequency, deal with it normally, and then right at the end when you get your answer in frequency, change it to wavelength. But try to keep all of your thinking mentally in the frequency category. Wavelength is just like a little cherry on the top, a little changing units to make it convenient. Don't overcomplicate things and think that wavelength you've got to do anything special for. So, by them asking the wavelength of the sound detected, we could work out the frequency detected, then plug it back into this equation here and work out the wavelength. All right, so let's get started by first of all writing down the equation exactly as it looks here. Please, if you decide you're going to change it already and you do it wrong, then no marks for an incorrect um, changed formula. But if you do that, even if what you write next is completely wrong, you still get the first mark. Okay, so here we are looking for the frequency that is observed. So we're looking for FL. Our value of V, we were given as 340, and it's going to be 340 on the top and 340 on the bottom. In this case, we were told that the train, which is the source, moves towards him. So we know that the velocity of the listener is going to be my zero. So I'm going to leave off the listener. The observer is not moving. Here, the speed of the train is 15 meters per second. Now, remember what I said earlier. We want our frequency here to go up because they're moving towards each other. So to make this value bigger, we need to make our denominator smaller. So that's going to become a minus. Bigger divided by smaller gives me a larger frequency of the observer, okay? So that's what we're gonna have there, multiplied by the frequency of the source, and the frequency of the source was our 520 hertz. All right, now please be careful with your maths here. This is the only real place that you can mess up. So rather go slowly than end up with anything being wrong. 340 minus 15 gives me 325 times by five, 20. So I times that by 340, I divide it by 325. I didn't do that right. 340 divided by 325 times 520. And I get an answer that the frequency is 544 hertz. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to point out a couple of important things here. The first important thing is check that your value is kind of in the same range as the actual frequency. This was 520, this is 544, that's kind of the same range. If we had 520 and suddenly this is a million and, there's probably been a mistake, okay? So please always make sure that you do that slowly. The second thing is we said here that the frequency has to go up. Check that the frequency actually does go up. You'd be amazed how many people go, the frequency must go up, get an answer that the frequency has gone down and they don't realize that something went wrong. So it's possible that you didn't think correctly and that was the wrong sign and there was something else that happened, but you've got to make sure that you follow through. Now, the last part was this question didn't ask for the frequency observed, it asked for the wavelength. So we've got to go back and use this formula. So V is equal to F lambda. 340 is equal to 544 times by the wavelength. I'm aware of the fact that some of you have already got an answer. So 340 divided by 544 gives me an answer that the wavelength is equal to 0 0.625 or 0.63 meters. Please note, just a general thing, if your frequency increases, your wavelength should decrease, okay? So since V remains constant, these two will always move in opposite directions. Frequency goes up, wavelength goes down, or if your frequency goes down, your wavelength will go up. That's one of the things that they sometimes kind of ask you multiple choice type questions around. All right. I'm going to quickly pause this for just a second. And I want to ask, I can now see all of you. I don't know if you can necessarily see each other, but I'm going to quickly ask who understood that question and then maybe hadn't understood or understood or done Doppler before. Is there anyone here where that now makes good enough sense that you're relatively comfortable with it? If you've already understood it before, that's fantastic. Okay. There are a couple of you where that makes more sense. I do find that this is one of the easier sections. There's a very good chance that many of you understood it before and continue to understand it now, which is wonderful. This is just extra practice, different question. All right, the question 6.2 then says, explain why the wavelength in 6.1.1 differs from that obtained in 6.1.2. So I would say here something like due to the relative motion of the source and the observer the wavelength oh sorry let's go with frequency the frequency increases you may want to say something about them moving towards each other the relative motion of the source and source and the observer towards each other The frequency increases, and therefore, since the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. All right. Now, the last question is one that we're actually only really going to be able to do properly once we have gone and looked at our photoelectric effect, which is um, the last section I know my school has to cover, because once we've done the photoelectric effect, a lot of things make a lot more sense. But I'm gonna quickly touch on it, and I hope that in covering this in probably a little bit more detail than some of the schools may have done, it will hopefully make decent sense to some of you. Okay, so we're gonna say here, use, the answering the question, use your knowledge of the Doppler effect to explain redshifts. I'm going to quickly teach you a little bit about redshifts. Okay. The first thing I need to do, just give me a second, is I need to get my snipping tool out because I need to steal a picture. All right. Just a second. I will be with all of you in a second. Um, just quickly need to steal one picture from the internet and then <laughs> we'll be able to go, okay. I want a particular one and I'm looking for it. Come on. So 
Sorry, I'm trying to wait for it so it clears up and I've got a nice version of it. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is a section that some of the schools may already have done, but most of you I don't think have. All right, so we're gonna be talking just quickly about the idea here of emission and absorption spectra, okay? And this technically falls under the photoelectric effect, which is the next section that I know, as I said, my school's doing. I don't think most of the other schools are doing it for a little while. And this deals with the idea of what we call as an emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum. Um, have any of you ever wondered about how we know, know for a fact that there are certain elements found on planets that we've never been to. How do we know that there's hydrogen and helium in the sun? Who went to the sun and scooped up some of the gas that's burning that's so super hot and said, oh, look, it's hydrogen and helium. How do we know what Jupiter is made of? And we know the chemical composition of a whole, whole part of the universe that we've never explored. And it's using this idea of emission and absorption spectra. Okay, so I'm going to quickly spend some time right now covering what they are in detail, and then we're going to explain what the shift really means, because explaining a shift makes no sense if you don't understand what they are. So what I'd like to explain to you, first of all, is we're going to be looking at an atom. An atom has a nucleus in the center, and then it has various orbitals around it. We're going to be viewing these right now, not necessarily as orbitals, but as energy levels. And if you have an electron that's in its correct place, the lowest possible energy, we call that its ground state. We always teach you when um, we did alpha diagrams, the electrons will occupy the orbitals and they'll go to the lowest possible energy, blah, blah, blah. It's a fact that electrons don't have to sit in, sit in that lowest possible energy. Electrons can gain energy, they can absorb energy, they can get excited. And when an electron gets excited, it will absorb a specific amount of energy that relates to the energy difference between where it is and where it wants to be. And it will jump up to a higher energy state. So this electron may jump up. I'm going to try and take the electron with it, all of it. It's a little negative as well. It's negative, it's not moving. I'm going to make its negative go away. Let's pretend. And it's negative made its way. Yay, the whole electron made, made its way across. I'm just going to make that go away by wiping it out. All right. So that is an excited electron. Okay. So an electron can jump from a ground state, which is the lowest energy state, to an excited state. And in order to do that, it must absorb a specific quanta of energy. Okay, but it has many options. This little electron jumped from here to here, but it could just as easily maybe have jumped from here only up one energy, one level. If it jumped only one energy level, this would require less energy. Okay, when you were in grade 10, you learned about photons. And you learned that the energy of a photon was equal to HF, where H is Planck's constant. And F is the frequency. So we can say that what happens here is that the amount of energy for this little electron to jump from one place to another could be a different form of energy. And that different form of energy that it could be is that it could absorb a photon of light that had exactly the right amount of frequency for it to jump from one energy level to another or from one energy level to another energy level. Please bear in mind, depending on how many electrons there are in an atom, it can have multiple what we call transitions, a jump in energy level. Okay, so this is a relatively higher grade concept. Can I double check who is still with me? Is everybody kind of following the trend of what I'm talking about still? Okay, good, 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 perfect. All right, so 
I'm going to quickly go back to where I was and then we're going to carry on. Now, when we talk about energy of a photon, depending on the frequency, hopefully when you know, you know or understand that when it comes to frequency, in light, frequency is equal to the color. So, if I have a black body, which in this case is effectively our white light, I know there's some contradiction there, but if I have a source of white light and I send it through a prism, the light will get bent by different amounts, okay, it'll get refracted by different amounts, and I will end up splitting my white light into all of the different colors of the spectrum. We call this a continuous spectrum. Over here on this end, we have our purple, which is our high frequency light. And on this end, we have our lower frequency. I don't know why there's any uh, purple on this end. This should definitely end on red. So we're just gonna make that but go away before it confuses you, okay? Gonna make it go away. There we go. Nobody's gonna say there's purple on the end of a spectrum on my watch. Good. <laughs> and this contains basically all energy values. Yes, they're quantized. So each photon is only a specific energy, but we've got photons with every single energy. Now what happens is if we have a dilute, uh, sorry, wrong one. If we have our white light and we shine it through a cool gas made up of these atoms, what will happen is that these electrons will absorb exactly the right amount of energy to make their energy jumps from a low energy state to their excited state. They're gonna absorb the energy. When they absorb that energy, that photon is no longer on the spectrum. So say this um, big jump here, which is the largest, will take the highest frequency. So here, remember I told you this will absorb more energy, big jump, that means it'll correspond to a photon of higher frequency. And when it removes that photon of higher frequency, it literally disappears. That color is no longer there anymore. You can see here that that shows over there. And then maybe there's another transition somewhere, which will be that color and that color, that frequency, energy color, frequency, energy color, etc. Okay, so this over here is what we call our absorption spectrum. Because different elements have different electrons, different numbers of electrons, different energy levels, they will have different combinations of exactly which frequencies of photons get absorbed. So it's almost like they have their own special fingerprint. And that is how we know when we look at different stars in the, the universe, and the light from them reaches us, we can see that certain colors are missing. Certain specific frequencies have been absorbed. And because we know what our fingerprints look like on Earth, we can play snap and go, ah, oh, cool, that looks like our hydrogen, okay? So we can therefore deduce that certain planets, stars, whatever in the universe have specific colors. All right, now the one thing I wanted to do here just quickly is explain to you what I meant by the shift. So I'm gonna quickly draw on here, I actually need to raise that first. I need to draw on here, just quickly with my pen, all of the lines. So I'm gonna draw there, 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 and there, there and there. We usually do this just for the record, specifically for hydrogen, because hydrogen is one of the most abundant elements in the universe and we can see it. So. Imagine I had somewhere in the universe this combination. We would look at it and we go, ah, those spaces are exactly the same as this element on Earth. But what about if instead of them being here, they all move just slightly to the side? Okay. We'd probably be able to look at it and say, whoa, that's the same as that, except that all of their frequencies, okay, look at them, have moved slightly into the higher frequency category. That means we can call it blue shifted. Now remember, higher frequency says that they are moving towards each other. So if we were to look into outer space 
and see an absorption or emission spectrum. They're just different sides, different perspectives. One's the absorbing energy and one's later giving it off. Okay. So if we were to look at the, either the emission or absorption spectra of planets or stars or whatever far away from us, and they were blue shifted, that tells us that their apparent frequency is higher than we expect, which says that they're moving towards us. Okay. Blue shifted means that there is a relative approach. They are moving towards each other. If on the other hand, and I'm hoping I can capture just these again, good, they are shifted in the other direction. Okay. Can you see that they're all more red than they were before? That means that they are red shifted. And if they are red shifted, that means there is a relative movement away from each other or apart. Now, what actually happens here, if we look at the entire universe around us, and we take our telescopes out and we look at all of the different planets and stars around us, we will see that all of the other planets have a relative movement where um, they're all red shifted which tells us that they're all moving away from us. Not one, not two, all of them. And that is the basis under which we say that the universe is, is expanding. Everything is moving away from everything else, which means by default that we think it's expanding. Can I quickly ask, does anybody have any questions on this? I'm hoping that it makes decent sense to you at this point in terms of being able to put all of the little bits together and make sense. Fortunately for you, you usually don't have to be able to explain redshift and blue shift in great detail. You just have to go, ah, oh, look, high frequency, blue shift, they move away. Uh, sorry, blue shift, yeah, they move away. No, blue shift, they move towards, getting my directions wrong. Or red shift, they move away from each other, the universe is expanding. Okay, so you usually get away with a very simple explanation of it, but it is important to understand it. Okay. I've been asked to explain the absorption spectrum again. Okay. So, Rebecca, are you with me? Can I ask you to just quickly come on um, to turn on your microphone so that I can chat to you while I'm doing it? Yeah, sure. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. So, first of all, do you appreciate that within the atom, we have quantized energy levels, so electrons can only be at certain places? Do you understand yes. that bit? You understand that at a, a ground state, an electron will be in its lowest possible energy state. And if it absorbs energy, it can jump to a higher energy state. Yes. Okay. In order to do that, it needs to absorb a specific amount of energy. The energy that it absorbs is going to come from the white light that passes through it. Because the white light contains every single one of the different frequencies, that's available, we can from it get any one of the energies that we possibly could have for the electrons to transition from one energy level to another. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's going to want to absorb. So maybe this is the tricky bit for you, is to understand that the energy here that it uses to jump up an energy level comes from light shining on it. Light shining on it contains a specific amount of energy depending on the frequency of the light and Planck's constant, which is a constant. But since we've got a continuum of different frequencies in our visible spectrum, we've got every single possible energy level that this would need in order to jump from one to another. Does that make sense? Yeah. So ma'am, the lines on the absorption spectrum, are those fixed lines or do they differ for every... Every element? element will have a different number of lines. There'll be different spaces. They'll be depending on the actual energies of those electrons, where they're in the ground state, to the difference of where they're going to. So we even sometimes, and this is more photoelectric effect, but we draw energy levels where we talk about E0, E1, E2, and we might potentially say, let's say this is a value of zero, this is a value of 200, this is a value of 600, pretending, please they give you different values here. I could say that to jump from energy level one to two, I need 400 joules, kilojoules, usually these will be tiny, tiny values, 
that that'll be the exact amount of energy that it'll need to gain. If it wants to go from here to here, it'll have to gain a full 600. And from that, I can work backwards to work out exactly which frequency of light. Please, the 400 and 600 are completely made up numbers. They have nothing to do with the frequency of light and they won't work. All right. So okay, I sometimes imagine it's a little bit like here. This is like a buffet. Every possible energy you could want is here. And these energy jumps correspond to specific frequencies. So all of the light of that energy will be absorbed. All of the light of that energy will be observed, absorbed. And these create little fingerprints of the different elements that you can tell which particular element you've got. All right. Did I answer your question sufficiently well, Rebecca? Yes, you did. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Does anyone else have any questions on this? Okay, let's just quickly check. Do the black lines correspond to the photons that the energy absorbs? Yep, they do. So the black lines here say that this um, purple, which was here, if we take it out, the purple isn't going to be there. There's not going to be visible light there because that photon, which is a particle of light, has been absorbed. And if we remove light particles, what we get is not light. And not light is dark. It's black. Okay? So where we don't have any light. Black is actually the absence of any other light. Okay? So black isn't a color in itself. It's the absence of, of photons coming back off something. No light gets reflected off it or comes back. So here, if this frequency was absorbed and this frequency was absorbed, this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, and this frequency, that's where we get these. What you'll notice here is that on the absorption and emission spectrum, we actually have the same combination of bands that are absorbed because just as the electron can gain energy to become excited, it can also lose that energy and relax down to ground state. And when it does that, when it gives off all those that energy, the energy is given off at exactly the same amount of energy, therefore exactly the same frequency as it started at. Because it's the same amount absorbing and being emitted, we're going to have the exact same transition. So you'll see that your emission spectrum, instead of it being a white light through a cool gas, then through a prism, the prism's only function here, just for the record, is to spread the light out so that we can see all of the different individual frequencies separated. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a rather complicated concept, which usually doesn't get tested in quite this much detail. So I'm going to leave it if everybody is okay with it. I'd like to leave it here and jump back to the Doppler effect. The reason I went into so much detail here is that I find that quite often you all just learn that it's red shifted. And half of you don't even know what it is. You're just sitting there going, oh, it's red shifted. Cool. Write it down on the paper. And that's fine if it gets your mark. But I sometimes find that people want to have a little bit more of a deep, little bit more of an understanding of what they're writing down. And even for me to go and say, oh, the universe's um, absorption spectra are all red shifted. You, you don't understand what you're talking about unless we know what the shift is that we're talking about specifically. So it's our high frequency, low frequency that results in the specific colors. And it's these actual fingerprints of the different elements, energy transitions that we see on other the planets and in the universe that allows us to know things. It's also one of the ways that we can work out which elements are found on Earth. Just so you know, we usually look specifically at hydrogen's um, absorption and emission spectrum because it has the fewest lines out of all of the other elements. Okay, remember hydrogen technically only has one electron. So it's much easier to predict where that electron can go. As soon as you've got multiple electrons, they can all do these kind of transitions. And it gets very, very unnecessarily complicated. All right. So what I'd like to suggest for the remaining time that we've got is that we um, do some more past paper questions. Can I quickly have a show of hands? Who's good with more past paper questions? Or more exam type questions? Fantastic. So that's where we're going to go back to. We're going to do probably just one more, but please, oh, let's try to share to the right place. There we go. Okay. All right. So the last question, sorry, I just quickly wanted to get back to over here, was the rest of this question, which said, um, use your knowledge of the Doppler effect to explain red shifts. So what you could say here 
is that when we look at the absorption or emission spectra, those lines that I just explained to you, of stars or planets, we see that they are red shifted which indicates that they are a lower frequency and then i'd say something about according to the doppler effect this indicates that they are all moving away from each other or that they are moving away from earth And since they are moving away, therefore we can say that the universe is expanding. Just in case anybody doesn't think that these things are real life or important, I always use an example here that I was actually really chuffed to discover. I don't know if any of you know the school St. Cyprian's in Cape Town. I don't know if any of you are aware of the fact that St. Cyprian's actually has its own observatory, okay? When I talk about an observatory, I'm talking about a proper observatory for observing the stars. And the reason that St. Cyprian's has this observatory is that there is a female astronomer, and I don't actually know where she comes from. Just give me a second, I'm gonna see if I can move this. There is a female astronomer who um, has set up observatories at various girls' schools across um, the world. So she has her observatory stations where she monitors what happens in the stars. And um, she monitors usually when it's um, daytime where she lives, she can monitor, monitor what's happening around, around the world. And um, she set them up at various girls' schools. But if you go to St. Cyprian's in Cape Town, they actually have an observatory which is collecting and monitoring these exact spectra that we're talking about. So they actually have them there and they're busy recording them and getting them. So it's a rather, rather cool aspect, I think, for the, the students that go there. All right, question six. A racing car approaches the finishing line in a race at a constant speed of 284.4 kilometers per hour. The engine of the car produces a sound of frequency 1,200 um, 1, hertz, and we're told that the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. So V is equal to 340 meters per second. The frequency of the source is 1,200 hertz, and over here, the car approaches the finishing line at a constant speed. That is the V, um, where are we at? That's VS, okay, because the, the engine's what's making the noise. So the first thing says, state the Doppler effect in words. It is the apparent change in frequency. You've got to mention all of these words. The apparent change in frequency due to the relative motion between a source or of a source and an observer. We are then asked to calculate the frequency of the sound heard by a man standing at the finishing line. So they would like you to work out the frequency of the observer or the listener. Now, ladies and gentlemen, because we've got a little bit of time left, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to try and answer this question on your own while I work out my answer and then we'll compare. So please, can I ask you to do so straight away and then we'll compare.
Okay, if you've got an answer, I'd like a thumbs up or you can send it through. Okay, some of you have already got it. Okay, that's good. Good, good, good. Can I ask if you've got it to quickly type it into the chat so that we can compare? It's quite a lot bigger than the original. This is one case where they aren't that comparable. And I found that the reason that it's quite a lot bigger is um, that the source and the speed of sound are so close together. Okay, Adrian, I'm happier with your results. Okay, we're getting different answers. This gets interesting. I want to just point out something to everybody here, that the frequency of the listener of the observer should be higher. I do, however, just suddenly realize that I may have messed up here completely because I didn't convert kilometers per hour to meters per second. Let's all quickly go and do that. That moment where, where you realize that you've had a very, very long day. Good news is I don't think I was the only person who did it. So let's quickly see if those of you who did it got a closer answer. If I, my answer is not closer to yours. Yay, okay, more of you are correct. Well done, you brilliant bright sparks. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the most popular answer, I'm pleased to say, is the one that's correct. Yeah, we all make the same mistakes on occasion, it happens. All right, so let's just quickly share again. So, First thing we had to do was realize that they were approaching each other because he's waiting at the finishing line. So he's coming towards him, which means that the frequency will be higher, which means that the denominator must be smaller so that the frequency is higher. So that means we're doing um, a minus. So it's a value divided by a smaller number gives us a bigger frequency. You had to convert this value into meters per second by dividing by 3.6. So please remember kilometers per hour to meters per second is a divide by 3.6. So once we did the divide by six, we ended up with 79. So 340 divided by that value times 1,200 gave me that the frequency that's heard by the man standing at the finishing line is 1,563,22 hertz. Then you are asked here to draw a frequency versus time graph for the sound as the car approaches the man then passes him. Now you'll notice here that they don't say anything about putting values on it. So I'm going to very quickly pause and give all of you a chance to answer this last question just before we go through it together. Okay, so quickly answer the last question and then we'll be done properly for today. This last question is a bit of a challenging one, so it's a good idea to actually stay and do it properly. Okay. All right, I'd like a thumbs up when you're done with that. Okay, good. Fantastic. All right, I want to be able to discuss it. So I'm going to share it with you right now. Now, who's got a diagram that looks like mine, where you have a high frequency 
and then it immediately drops with a vertical line to a low frequency. Does anyone have that? Okay, this is where we start covering important concepts that link to this. And the first is that when it approaches, it's going to have the higher apparent frequency. When it moves away, it's going to have a lower apparent frequency. Something that you may have noticed is I never once in all of these questions asked, how far away is it from the source? I simply asked, how fast is it approaching or moving away? So that means that as long as it's moving towards, whether it's very far away, closer, 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 it's going to have the same frequency. As it passes, it changes from moving towards to moving away, and then it's going to drop to a lower frequency. Now, a couple of important things here, okay? I, first of all, probably should not have had this arrow down the middle, so I'm going to quickly move it, is that I did not have to have that there. That could be down at the bottom over there. So there's, this isn't necessarily a zero point. One of the things that I have to draw here, so you've got to go from a higher to a lower, doesn't actually matter where your axis is, but realistically, the frequency should be positive. Where I had it before, I had a negative frequency, so that was nonsense. So I'm going to just quickly edit this so that it looks like that. So both of these should above, it should be a higher to a lower. My, my um, time axis was in the wrong place. We didn't go from a positive to a negative, so it's just one to the other. Something that's very important for you to note is that your true frequency doesn't actually sit dead center between the two of you, uh, sorry, between the two of them. So it isn't a case that it's equally, um, it goes up by the same amount and down by the same amount. It doesn't work that way. So every now and again, you get a nasty simultaneous equation, the kind we're going to deal with in the next lesson and then in the master class as well, where you actually have to do a simultaneous equation and they'll give you information about what the frequency is when it approaches and what the frequency is when it goes away. So frequency observed when it's coming towards, frequency observed when it's coming away, but they don't tell you. So they'll give you this value, okay? But they won't tell you that, sorry, frequency of the source or the listener or that. So you'll have two variables that you don't know and you have to do a nasty simultaneous equation. And what you'll see if you do that is that the true frequency of the source, okay, sorry, I was saying we get the listener, so it'll usually be that. The true frequency of the source is not halfway between the higher frequency and the lower frequency as it approaches and leaves. It's not dead center between the two. It's between the two, but it's not in the middle always. Okay, in fact, I've never seen it in the middle. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop sharing, so quickly take a screenshot if you need it. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson, particularly if you haven't done the section before. I find that it's a really interesting one, but it's also one of those nice sections because you can kind of view it in its entirety. All right, I look forward to seeing you all on um, Thursday where we're going to do a little bit more practice and hopefully go through a couple more examples linked to this so we can make sure that everybody gets the ideas properly.